Pastor Jeff, I'm the executive pastor here at Discover Family Church, and I get the opportunity to be able to share this third message. I know it was a big secret. We put it up here. We did Son of God. We did Son of Man, and now we are doing Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Amen? All right, all right. Y'all waking up. It's okay. You might have had one cup of coffee. We'll, 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 we'll gauge your attentiveness and response on cups of coffee. That is my preferred methodology of assessing that kind of thing. I'm a big coffee drinker. I like it. So, Jesus is Lord of all. Amen? Man, y'all went from one cup of coffee to half a cup of coffee. Jesus is Lord of all. Amen? Hey, three cups of coffee. Here we are. All right. Wonderful. That's my preferred amount of cups of coffee, so if we can keep things at three cups of coffee, that would be great. So we're actually going to be talking about a section of Scripture today to demonstrate how Jesus is Lord of all that you might not have anticipated. You might not have expected to be studying this particular passage of Scripture when looking at Jesus' Lordship. And the reason I say that is because we are going to be talking about Jesus' betrayal, by one of his best friends, one of his close confidants, one of the 12 disciples. Y'all know who it is? Yeah, don't be a Judas, right? Like, his name is synonymous with betrayal. Like, this is not a new thing. Like, you knew who it was going to be, right? Zero cups of coffee. Got it. So, we're, we're going to work on that. We're going to work on it. It's okay. But, Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends. He's in the garden. He knows what's about to happen. He just had the Last Supper. They just celebrated Passover. And Jesus said words to describe what was about to happen that they didn't really get. But they said, hey, y'all, we got to go pray. Right? How many of you know that you guys should have, we should all have a good prayer life? Jesus prayed. Jesus. Get that through your head for a second. Jesus prayed constantly. Jesus prayed all the time. He spent time with his Father. If he had to do it, how in the world do we expect to get by through life without it? He was constantly going off on his own to spend time with his Father. And this time he invited some of his friends some of his closest friends, and said, hey, I need you to come pray with me. Please, I I got stuff going on. I need you to pray with me. Jesus demonstrated that for us. How often are we a little bit timid about asking for our friends to pray with us about a situation? Even Jesus asked his friends to pray with him. Y'all, y'all need prayer. I don't know if you knew that. Y'all need prayer. I need prayer. We all need prayer. This is a broken world. It's a problem. But thank God, Jesus is Lord of all. And we're going to be demonstrating that. Yeah, that was like a quarter, a couple of sips of coffee maybe. I don't know. But Jesus is Lord of all, and we're going to be studying first out of John 18. And so we're going to be touching on a few different passages from different gospels talking about the same story. And what we call that is the harmony of Scripture. So it's not the same exact thing. But how many of you know that if you have five different witnesses to anything, you're going to have five different stories, right? Like people are going to see different things. People are going to pay attention to different details. People are going to be like, I don't know if that was exactly what I saw, if they hear somebody else's testimony. But all of those things point to the fact that This is truth. This is reality. This is what actually happened. And different people saw it from different perspectives and give us different details about it. And that's called the harmony of Scripture. So we're going to be looking at that. But our main passage today is going to be out of the Gospel of John, chapter 18. 
So when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So this wasn't a new thing, right? Like Jesus had a prayer garden. This wasn't the first time he ever went there. This, this wasn't like, oh, well, let, let's try a new venue. He had often gone there with his disciples to go pray. And so when they went there, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples, Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers. Do you all know what a detachment of soldiers is? I can tell you I did not know exactly what a detachment of soldiers was. But as we're reading through Scripture and as we're trying to get an idea of what really happened, because it's so easy to just look at the Scripture as stories. But we need to understand this was reality. This is what actually happened. A detachment of soldiers was somewhere between two and 400 soldiers. This is no small group of people. And it says that they were there with a detachment of soldiers and some officials and the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. So this is like, this is like a riot group, y'all. Like this is, this is a big group of people coming with torches, lanterns, weapons. In Mark chapter 14, it says, the crowd with him had swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So that's something else that we want to look at is the fact that, in case y'all didn't know, Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jews, they were in this land and then Rome came and occupied Right, like they were not their biggest fans. They weren't like, yay, Rome, thanks for coming. It was an issue, right? And then they collect taxes. But guess what? The one thing that they agreed on was they did not like Jesus. How many of y'all know if you're doing the right thing, if you're following your calling, there's going to be people that aren't happy with you. There are going to be people that are upset. And in fact... (laughs) People that don't normally agree on other things might agree on not liking you. How do we know? Jesus did it. Jesus, our example, he was not liked by either two of these groups so much that they're like, hey, we can cooperate on this one. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me because it's not about what other people determine about my calling. It's not about what other people say or how they perceive, but I just got to do what I know I'm supposed to do. Amen? That was like half a cup of coffee. We're okay. We're okay. So when they came in, Jesus knowing what was going to happen to him, right? Like he's not unaware, people. He went out and asked them. He didn't wait. He didn't hide behind one of the plants in the garden. He went out to them and was like, hey, I see y'all are coming up here, right? And he asked them, he said, who is it that you're looking for? This is a rhetorical question. He knows what's about to happen. He knows that they're here for him. But he goes ahead and says, hey, who are you looking for? Standing right in front of them in plain day or plain evening, seeing as how there were torches and lanterns, most likely. Right? So he's saying, Hey, who you want? Who you want? Come on, let me know. And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered. He replied, I am he. And then this next part is really fun. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This detachment of two to 400 soldiers with spears and or clubs and or swords and or lanterns and torches, they're approaching a ragtag few guys in a garden praying. And Jesus walks out to them alone, everybody else behind them, 
And he goes out, says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And they fall back. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think that that's happenstance. There is power in the name of Jesus. Jesus wasn't just saying, I am he. He said, I am. Who was it that Moses, when he asked God, how am I going to approach Pharaoh? How am I going to talk to him? You know I'm not an orator. You know I can't do this on my own. He says, tell them, I am has sent you. And Jesus says here, I am he. And the power of the lordship of Jesus Christ knocks them on their butts. Praise God. You know what's being said in that moment about Jesus' lordship? In that situation, Y'all aren't taking me. I'm going freely. I know what's about to happen. But y'all are not the ones in control here. I merely say my name and knock you on your butt. Yet I'm going to go. I'm going to choose to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. And so then after they fall back, again he asked them, who is it you want? Like, okay, let's try this again. Who? I didn't quite hear you. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I imagine that was a, with a little bit more trepidation, with a little less confidence in their voice than the first time they asked. First time, we want Jesus of Nazareth. I am here. Whoa. Second time, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth? And he answered, I told you, I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. Even in that moment, even whenever he's fulfilling his calling, his purpose for his life. From birth, he was sent to earth to be the sacrifice for us. He knew in that garden what he was there to do, what was going to happen. And yet he's still being a shepherd and protecting those who are with him. And it says that this happened so that the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those that you gave me. And then Simon Peter. Y'all know about Peter? Peter's a fisherman. He's kind of rough around the edges. Maybe a little bit of a hothead. Simon Peter. Big personality. But also, if y'all remember, he's the one that jumped out of the boat. They saw Jesus on the water walking. And they said, Lord, is that you? He said, yes, it's me. And Peter said, if it is you, let me come out on the water. Let me walk on the water like what you're doing. Let me walk out to you. And he said, come on. And Peter out of all of them, was the only one jumped out of the boat. Only one. This might be some of the greatest faith that we see. But also, a little bit on the, let's call it, um, a little bit on, on the side of not thinking things through all the time. Right? But so, Simon Peter, who had a sword, y'all, he's a fisherman. Why does he have a sword? You don't fish with a sword. You fish with nets in that day, maybe a rod and reel, you cast a line. It's not a sword kind of occupation. But he had a sword, number one. I don't think he was well trained with that sword. And so, I don't know how this goes in your mind, but I'm going to explain a little bit of, of what I've learned through, this, through studying this section of Scripture. But it says, He drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So, this guy, a little bit hot-headed, a little bit probably not very well-trained with a sword, I always thought, man, like, 
and cut the guy's ear off. That's not how it happened, guys. Like, that, that can't be how it happened. You know why? Because Jesus didn't have to heal his shoulder. <laughs> he didn't cut off the ear and then he wasn't like, hey, I got the ear. Got it. Like I'm aiming exact. Yep. You think that was going to happen? No. What much more likely was the case, Peter, grabbing his sword, went to cut the guy's head off. And like I saw it and said, whoo, whoo. And when he goes, whoo, he almost got his head cut off. Like this isn't like, right? Like he, he's not trying to cut his ear off. He is attacking with full force, trying to cut the guy's head off. He's trying to take control of this situation. He's about to start a riot. Now, granted, he's part of a few guys. And there's a detachment of soldiers with weapons. And he tries to cut a guy's head off. What does he think the result is going to be? Like, what, what, what's your end game? Once again, probably not thinking ahead all the way through. But what does Jesus do in this moment? He commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink of the cup that my father gave me? What do those words say? Those words confirm. These people aren't the ones in control of this situation. This group of guys, do you think they're in charge here? He's telling Peter, look, my father is in charge. And I'm doing what I'm doing willingly. They're not taking me. I'm giving myself over to my Father's will. I'm doing what my calling is to do. He knew exactly what was happening. And in this moment, all of those things demonstrate his lordship, that he is in control of that scene. He is not just doing whatever everybody wants. He is in control. He demonstrates his lordship. And if he's in control whenever he's being arrested, man, out of everybody that might have looked at that situation from the outside, they'd have seen a bunch of soldiers going in. Like, if I'm just, like, standing 50 yards off and I don't hear anything what's going on, I see a bunch of soldiers go into the garden to arrest Jesus. I see Jesus leave with them. I was like, man, that doesn't look like a good day for Jesus. From the world's perspective, Rome got what they wanted. The Jewish leaders got what they wanted. It doesn't look like it's a good thing for Jesus. But yet Jesus was the one who was in complete control in that situation. Sometimes you might have things happening in your life. You say, Jesus, it doesn't look like you're in control. I want to believe that you're in control, but it doesn't look like you're in control. It looks like everything that's happening doesn't make sense. It looks like the bad guys are winning. It looks like everything that's happening is out of your control. But Jesus says, no. He is Lord of all. Not over Lord of a little. Not over, not over some things. He's not Lord over a bit of your life. He is Lord over all, every situation. Everything that happens, he is Lord of. And it's not even like this was the first time that somebody tried to kill Jesus. He preached in his own hometown in the synagogue. And he made some people mad. Made some people mad. They were angry. In fact, it said in Luke... Chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. When they heard these things, after Jesus was preaching, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Man, that's a strong word right there, wrath. And they rose up to, and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built 
so that they could throw him off the cliff. This wasn't like, oh, I don't really agree with what you said, Pastor. It was like, this guy's blaspheming, and I am passionate enough about believing in what I believe that you got to die. Y'all, we don't have that kind of passion. These people who were in the synagogue that day, they weren't lukewarm Jews. They were passionate. They were looking for a Messiah. They wanted there to be a Messiah, but they said, I don't believe you're him, and you're making some claims that I don't agree with. And it made them mad. And they wanted to kill him. But listen to this. They wanted to throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. I don't know about you. Driven to the edge of a cliff. And then he's just like, actually, guys, not today. He just walks away. Like, you don't think somebody would have tried to stop him? You don't think somebody, except that Jesus is Lord. He is in control of that situation. Jesus knew that it was not his time and that was not the way it was going to happen. I'm not going to be thrown from a cliff. So sorry y'all wanted that, but not going to happen. See ya. He walks, he didn't even walk around them. It says he walked, he passed through their midst. Like, excuse me. I'm leaving. All right, see you guys. You're not killing me today. I already got an appointment. It's not today. But that's the thing. Jesus was Lord in that situation, and he was also Lord in the garden. He knew it was the appointed time. Jesus is Lord of all. Professor Mark Strauss, he's a professor of theology, says that to confess Jesus as Lord is to attribute to him all authority and all allegiance above all other authorities, all other rulers, all other gods, and all other hierarchies. And I'll add anything else that tries to dictate our attention. Anything that distracts us from knowing Jesus' lordship. We allow things to distract us from Jesus' lordship. We allow situations to distract us from Jesus' lordship. We allow circumstances. We allow relationships. We allow our own sinful, selfish desires to distract us from Jesus' lordship. But why does Jesus' lordship matter? What does that mean practically? How how is Jesus' lordship going to make a difference in my life on a day-to-day basis? Well, Jesus' lordship means that he's our focal point of our lives. Jesus is our focal point. What is a focal point? A focal point means that everything points to that one point. Everything points to it. You know, I I didn't even know this whenever I I, uh, wrote this particular example, but my folks are here today. Welcome, my folks, David and Sharon Ott. Hey, y'all. Good to have you. But this particular example includes my grandmother's house that is up in Pennsylvania on my mom's side. And I don't know if y'all know this, but, and definitely if you're a recent college grad and down, you probably don't even remember these things called console televisions. That was before they could hang on the walls, before plasma, before LEDs, before LCDs. We had tube televisions, and tube televisions kept on getting smaller and smaller and able to be put on top of other furniture. But at one point, they were furniture. It was called a console television. It was a large piece of furniture that stood inside a room. And you moved everything else because that was the heaviest, right? Like, once you got the TV in place, it's like, well, that's done. And now everything else points at that. The console television was the focal point of the room. I remember visiting my grandmother's house. They had a console television. And this is the television. Their couch faces this way. The armchairs face this way. The recliner faces this way. Everything points to that focal point. Everything points 
to the focal point. So if you walked in that room, you'd be like, hey, what's important in this room? That. How do I know? Everything points to that. The only purpose of being in this room is to look at that thing, apparently. It's obvious. You wouldn't walk in there and be like, huh, I wonder what we do in here. And there's a fireplace in there. Nothing pointed at the fireplace, although the recliner was close to it, so, you know, you could warm yourself while you're pointed at the console television. But nothing pointed at it. That's not the focal point. The focal point was the console TV, and I didn't have to know that the console TV was over there. If I looked at all the furniture, I knew that they were pointing at something. If you would have removed that console television, I would have been like, why in the world is everything pointed at that empty corner? Why? It makes no sense. Why aren't they at least facing each other or facing the fireplace or doing something else? It would have made no sense without the focal point. I got news. Jesus is the focal point of our lives. Without Jesus, it makes no sense. Without him, there is no focal point that makes any sense. We put ourselves, we put money, we put a career, we put a relationship, we put all these other things as the focal point of our life. And it's not. Jesus is Lord of all. He is the focal point of our lives. He is everything. He's not something. He is everything. He is Lord of all, and he is Lord over each. It's so big that it covers the entire universe and all of existence, yet it's so personal. That he knows the number of hairs on my head. It's a lot easier for me, I understand. He knows the number of hairs on y'all that have a lot more hair than I do as well. Even in this illustration of scripture that we're looking at, Jesus is doing the most important thing. The thing that points to the entire existence on earth. He came to save people. He came to sacrifice himself. He came to die. And he's on his way there. He knows it. He knows exactly what's happening. And yet, he takes a moment. He takes a moment to recognize that he's not just Lord of all, but he's Lord of each. He heals Malchus's ear. That's pretty awesome. Arguably. Not Jesus' most impressive miracle. Like, blind are seeing, lame are walking, people are healed of leprosy. Oh, and there's that ear thing. Okay. Sounds nice. But I guarantee you for Malchus, it made a difference. Jesus doesn't just care about the big picture. He cares about those things that don't seem so significant to you. You think, ah, he doesn't really want to know about that. He doesn't really care about that. I got news. He cares about the big and about the little. He cares about those things that are life impactful and those things that you think are just small details. He cares about each and every one of us. Not just all of us, but each of us. He's Lord of all and Lord of each. You know, there was a hashtag a while back. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, hashtag Roman Empire. Y'all, y'all know about when this happened a few years back? Um, so there's this thing. You were supposed to, women were supposed to ask their significant others to these men. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? What? I'm going to be completely honest. This Absolutely shocked me. Guess what the average answer was? Go ahead. Cups of coffee. Six? What? (laughs) 60%? Three times a day, I heard. So that hashtag had over 1.3 billion views, according to to a September 2023 CBS News report. This thing made the news, people. 
And according to the report, most men think about the Romans once a day. Once every day. 365 times a year, I think about the Roman Empire. I am not a history buff. That is not, in fact, Emily did actually see that. She asked me. I said, what are you talking about? Zero. Like, I never think about the Roman Empire. That is, that is not my jam, y'all. But apparently, the majority, the average response, so my zero would have been included, and then would have been offset by some of those that apparently think about the Roman Empire more than once a day. Some men said as often as three times per day. Man, those Romans. Man, I like roads and indoor plumbing. Man, they really had a really jam up job of their form of government. Like, wow, Romans. They're pretty incredible, right? Wasn't built in a day. But do we as Christ followers, who are supposed to have Jesus as our focal point of our lives, would we even lie to say that we think about our Savior as often as the average man, I say, lies about thinking about the Roman Empire? Would we even think to say at least once a day? Or is it, you know, church days? Do we think about him? It is, if that focal point, if that thing was removed, where's everything else in your life pointing? Was it pointing at him? If I look at your finances, they should point at the focal point. If I look at your schedule, they should point at the focal point. If I look at your family, your relationships, everything should point. Everything should be filtered through the fact that Jesus is Lord. In fact, Lord is Jesus' highest title. And we know this from Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord is his highest title. This verse, this points to the crux of all of Scripture. It was always Jesus. Old Testament pointing to the Messiah, pointing to Christ. New Testament, Christ sacrifices himself, and then people go and share the good news Everything, our timeline, A.D., B.C., what's the difference? Christ. Everything points to Christ as the focal point. Even in the garden, he was in control. Why? Because I don't know if you've thought about this. I've talked about it a couple of times, but Jesus... Get this straight. Was not plan B. From the beginning of time, God knew that giving us free will would result in sin. From the beginning of time, before time began, Jesus was the plan of redeeming humanity. God created all of the universe knowing that creating man and giving him free will would cause there to be the need for him to sacrifice his own son. I don't know about you. I don't know I could make that decision. I love my kids. They happen to be in here too. Well, if someone said, hey, you mind giving up one of your kids? Oh, I mind. What you talking about? That's not happening. Oh, but, but would you give them up for this stranger over here? <laughs> Who are you? What? <laughs> That's crazy talk. Would you give them up for your best friend? Nope, sorry. 
Would you give them up for people that are doing the wrong thing? That spit in your face? That terrorize you? I don't even know where this is going. Because I can't do any of that. I don't think you can wrap your head around the love of God. The love that he has for each and every one of us. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. In Romans 10, verses 9 through 11, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That's what water baptism is today, folks. It's that profession. I recognize Jesus as Lord in my life. I recognize that he's in control, I'm not. I recognize his lordship over all, but also lordship over me. Peter tried to take things into his own hands, but Jesus rebukes him. Matthew 26, verses 52 through 56. Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. Remember, harmony of scripture. Slightly different words than what were used before in the book of John. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? He has this conversation and says, Peter, you're trying to do it yourself. That's not what we got going on here. I am in control. These guys are not in control. You are not in control. I know you think you're doing something good. Hey, you're super courageous. Trying to cut a guy's head off when they got two to 400 backup. Might even be a little bit stupid. Except for that he knew he had Jesus on his side. And Jesus just says his name and they all fall. But Jesus says, Peter, that's not what we're doing here. Put that sword away. You don't think I could handle this? You don't think I could appeal to my father? You don't think my father loves me enough to do what needs to be done? But guess what? I'm not here to tell my father what's going to happen. I'm here to listen to his direction. I'm here to follow his will. In the garden, he prayed, Father, take this from me if you can. But even so, yet not my will, but your will. Not what I want, but what you want. How many times do we try to take those things into our own hands? but we're using the wrong weapons. We're trying to take a control of a situation that we've got no control. We don't don't control anything. God is always in control. And when we think we're in control, we're wrong. I don't know about a time whenever you might have thought that you were in control But sometimes it only takes one phone call to make you realize you're not. What I like to say is that that highlights the fact that we're not in control. It doesn't change because we were never in control to begin with. But those moments highlight the fact that we are not in control. You know, in Luke, chapter 22, that's where it actually records the healing of Malchus. It says, one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this, and he touched his ear and healed him. This man who was perceived to be his enemy, he said, no, 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 stop that. We're not doing that. Here it is. Let, Let me take care of that.
You know, we're supposed to pray for our enemies. Jesus healed his. But do we do that? Do we leave it in his control? Do we leave it in his hands? You know, Jesus treats enemies different than we do. Uh, Clint, if you could come up. We're going to wrap up. You know what? What Jesus was telling Peter that day was, I'm in control, you're not. I've got this under control. You don't need to handle it. And there's only going to be one person that's shedding blood today, and that's me. Because the shedding of Jesus' blood was for the redemption of the world, the redemption for you and I, the redemption for all but also the redemption for each, for every single one of us. You know, whenever we give our lives to Christ, whenever we ask Jesus to be Lord of all and Lord of us individually, it says that there's a, a, the throne of our heart and so what we're choosing to do is to give Jesus the throne of our heart, to declare, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. My decisions run through you. My perception runs through you. The direction for my life runs through you. You're the one. That's what baptism is. I got news. We have the prayer of salvation. That's the starting point. The prayer of salvation is not recognizing Jesus' Lordship. Just like love is not just saying, I love you. You can say, I love you with your mouth. But if your actions never back that up, it's just words. If I told my wife, I love you, but then I never did the dishes ever, if I never picked up after the dog, if I never took her out on a date, just the two of us, we got three kids, Lord, you know that that's necessary, right? If I never did any of those things, if I got home from work and was like, I'm just tired, I'm sorry, I can't spend time with you this evening. I'm sorry, I don't really feel like talking right now. I'm sorry, I got so much else going on in my life. I don't have time for you. Is that love? No. Love says, I'm putting you in a place of priority. Everything that I got going on, I want to bounce it off of you. Maybe while we're doing the dishes, that's real love, yo. Acts of service is a thing. Quality time is a thing. Gifts is a thing too. Get your wife some gifts every once in a while, guys. But real love. Jesus has real love for us, but do we give him real lordship? Do we truly let him sit on the throne of our hearts to be that filter for every decision, to be that guidance for every direction in our life. Who, I got a real big message today about Jesus as Lord. It literally is the crux of all of scripture, but it's also such a personal message for each and every one of us. Jesus isn't just the Lord of all, he's my Lord. He's the Lord of each one of us. And so, just using this as a little illustration here, but I think sometimes we have situations that arise in our life and we're like, hey, Jesus, you're Lord. But I'm just going to kind of lean right here, take a, take a little bit of this control here. You know, I, I don't need to make the decision, but I kind of just want to be adjacent to it. I just want to be right up next to it a little bit. Maybe, you know, maybe just a little. 
a little itch. Like, I don't want to say everything, but maybe I get to say how it's done. I'll, I'll, I'll obey what you say, but I'm also going to have a little bit of input. Just, just that much. I don't know if y'all know this. This is a one-seat throne. There's no co-pilot here. You know, I used to see those bumper stickers. Jesus is my co-pilot. Like, you are in a world of trouble. Jesus is supposed to be driving. I'm just saying. Jesus isn't supposed to be our co-pilot. The throne of our heart is a one-seater, and he's the one that belongs in it. And yet, like, Jesus, this is tough. I don't really want to give you all the control in this situation. You could just scooch. Just, yeah, just a couple inches. Oh, now I can, I can kind of pick up my other foot and feel a little bit better. Still a little bit uneasy about it, though. A little bit off balance. If I could just, oh, oh, oh. You still, oh, you're not on the throne anymore? Oh, if you could just really stay really close, though. I'll use you as an advisor. I'm going to make the decision. But I really like to have you as a consultant. I got news. Jesus isn't an advisor. He's not a consultant. Jesus is Lord of all. Our proper position isn't here. It's not even leaning. It's definitely not here. Our only proper position is here. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're in control. Thank you that you're in control of my finances. Thank you that you're in control of my family. Thank you that you're in control of my relationships. Thank you that you're in control of my health. Thank you that you're in control in every situation in my life, and I surrender to you. That is what giving Jesus lordship looks like. Surrender, not just a little, but surrender of all of who we are, everything in our lives. It's not about, oh, Jesus is just a consultant or a good teacher. I think about him every once in a while. Maybe not as much as Rome, but, you know. But how many of you know that we have a hard time just taking a little? We have a hard time just be like, oh, I'm kind of in control. Eventually, you end up here on the throne of your own heart. But Jesus was not just a man. He's Lord of all. And y'all, some of you might have thought you were going to get away without a C.S. Lewis quote today, but you're not. Jesus was not just a moral teacher. C.S. Lewis put it this way. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people often say about him, talking about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would have to be the devil of hell. You must make your own choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about this being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus was not a teacher only. He is Lord of all. He is Lord of each. It is that representation that we do today in water baptism. Lord, I'm dying with you and I'm raising up a new creature. I'm representing death of my old self 
and a rebirth into a life where you are my Lord, not just my Savior. This isn't fire insurance. I'm not just trying to stay out of hell. I'm trying to live life more abundantly. I'm trying to fulfill the will of God in my life. I'm trying to run towards him. It's not lukewarm. I mean, the water might be. But we can't be lukewarm. Jesus is Lord of all. And he should be Lord of each of us. Amen? Oh, y'all got half a cup of coffee there, but it's okay. Jesus is Lord of all. Y'all, if you could bow your heads with me. You know, there, there might be somebody in this room that says, you know, I, I might have said a prayer at some point in time, but I'm definitely sitting on my own throne of decision sometimes. I don't, I don't know that Jesus is actually always my Lord. I don't know that that I'm filtering all of my things, all of my circumstances, all of my decisions, all of the guidance for my life. I don't know that I'm actually treating Jesus as Lord in my life. We're gonna say a prayer. And it's not just a prayer of salvation, but it's a prayer that says, and, and hear me closely, Jesus doesn't take it lightly and neither do we. But you might have said a prayer of salvation at some point, but you recognize that Jesus is not Lord in your life. But you want him to be. You want him. You want to have that person that bears the burden for us. Because we can't do it on our own. But if that's you, just raise your hand real quick and put it right back down. Thank you, thank you. You can put it down. And even if you didn't raise your hand, maybe you didn't want to raise your hand, but you can pray along with us anyway. So if everyone would just pray along with me. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for Jesus. I want to recognize him as Lord in my life, not just my Savior, but also the Lord of every decision, the Lord that I run to, the Lord that comforts me. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. I recognize that you didn't just die to save me from my sins, but to demonstrate your love for me and to be Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we got some baptisms today. So we're gonna, we're gonna transition here with a song. We got our wonderful worship team up here. So thank you all for, for being a part of it. I'm 
baptisms and I love the message you guys can have a seat the message today and uh, especially that illustration with the throne and the chair so many of us each and every day we, we understand that that makes sense to us but for so many of us I think we, we put Jesus on that throne every Sunday <laughs> and then uh, and then we boot him off and we, we go throughout our week, and he's not there. And then every Sunday morning we come in, we feel guilty, right? Forgive me, I've done the wrong stuff. Please sit on the throne. And we walk out, and for some of us, we're not even to our car <laughs> before we push them off again. Like, no, nope, no, 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 no. I can't have you there. And today we get to celebrate baptisms and, and baptisms for us is, is is a public proclamation of what God has done in our heart and what it is is these group of people that have said you know what I'm not kicking them off that throne when I walk out of here it's not about Sunday morning it's about my life it's about him being Lord of my life this whole series is talking about how Jesus is more than just some character in the Bible he's more than just he's more can I tell you he's more than just our Savior he is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the Lord of my life. And so today we get to celebrate that. And I, I can't wait to see and uh, what God does. Can I tell you, I love this, but what I really can't wait to see is what God does in the lives of all of these people after today. 
Because today they 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 are going to make a public proclamation to you. They want you to know they love Jesus and they're living for him. But then tomorrow they get to walk in that. And there's there's something powerful about walking in the knowledge and the presence of God. Amen. Amen. So why don't we uh, start bringing them on over here? Who we Everybody give it up for Serenity Killingsworth. Oh, it is so good to have Serenity here. Serenity, how old are you now? Six. Six years old. I don't know about you guys, but I love this. This is awesome. <laughs> are you getting embarrassed? <laughs> it's okay. And I made the cool thing. Everybody asked if the water was warm, and 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 just so you guys know, this is a um, an inflatable hot tub. Uh, you can buy these on Amazon. Go to town. Uh, I told them we're not running the bubbles. Uh, you know, we, but but we are. Uh, it, it is warm enough, and so Serenity, come here. Serenity is is one of uh, the the Discover family babies. Like we we've, just, we've known her her whole life, and now little brother. And and I've loved watching her grow up, and and how I'm her favorite pastor in the whole wide world. I love it. I love it. I love Serenity, and I love watching her with the other kids, and watching her worship too. She'll be in here. Uh, because daddy plays bass. Uh, and and so she'll be in here during worship practice and I'll watch her worship. I'll, I've watched her lift her hands. I've watched her pray to God. So Serenity, you love Jesus with all your heart? Mm-hmm. You can live for him all that is your life? Yes. And you're going to obey your mommy and daddy? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you'll get in trouble. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, Serenity, why don't you come right over here? I'm going to set this down. I really love this one. This is this is special for me. I I've, I've had the the joy of baptizing a couple of my boys and now I get to baptize my niece, Amelia. Amelia, I love you so much and I'm so proud of you. Amelia has such a heart for God and such a heart for people. She loves people. She has the biggest heart on the planet and I absolutely adore you so much. I'm proud of you. I am I am proud that you're part of our church and that you get to help not just come to our church and not just work with our kids. She works upstairs with our kids all the time, but I'm proud of the example that you are. You know what? You're giving a lot of adults their run for their money on how much you love Jesus. You love Jesus with all your heart? Yes. You going to live for him all the days of your life? Yes. You want to say anything else? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Why don't you get on your knees? Uh, he's not going to fit. <laughs> Come on in, Caleb. There you go. You're going to have to get to the very front. <laughs> yeah. Caleb's another one that's been around for a while. I, I love you, buddy. I do. Can I tell you right now, this guy has a heart uh, 
for, for kids, has a heart for people that need Jesus. He works with our kids each and every week. Can I tell you right now at Discover Family Church, if you don't know this, we love our kids. Uh, and we do not babysit our kids. Our kids know Jesus, and they get to hear about Jesus, and Caleb is a part of that each and every week. And I, I've loved watching you grow up. I mean, grow, because he used to be shorter than me. Um, but watching you grow in your love for Jesus, you love him with all your heart? You live for him all the days of your life? You want to share anything? No, I didn't think so. Why don't you get on your knees for me, buddy? Yeah, Brandy! Woo! That's, that's that giant dude's mom. Uh, Brandy has been around. You've been around here since almost the beginning. Yeah, almost the very beginning. She's been a part of it. She was back whenever we were at the YMCA, way up on the north side, and then the other building that we lost, and the other building that we lost, and then the place we're at now. And she's, been, she's followed us all the way around. And it's not that you can I tell you right now, her heart for people, her love for people, her love for Jesus is infectious. I love watching her. There, can I tell you right now, I, I know I'm a pastor and, and, and I do have the joy of the Lord, but there are Sundays when you walk in and you're tired and there's Sundays when you're like, ah, okay, God, you got to do something. And can I tell you almost every single time, Brandy looks at me and goes, and I go, all right, I'm good. I'm good. Brandy brings me back. You know, she, she has just such a, a love and a joy. Uh, for Jesus. And so, Brandy, you can live for Jesus all the days of your life. What has he done in your life? Amazing things. I love, I love that. Well, today we are going to baptize you. So why don't you get on your knees for me? Amber Howell. Woo! Oh, I love Amber, too. So happy. I love having you here. Oh, yeah. You're wearing glasses. Eh, it's okay. They, they don't melt. It's all good. Mine are all speckled with water right now. Amber, I love you, and I love having you here. Amber is such a happy person, and I love watching her worship every week. I've watched her grow in her relationship with Jesus over the last few years. I've watched you come to know him more, come to know him better, come to share him. We've got people that are here today because you brought them. And I don't know about you guys, but that's exactly what God calls us to do, and that's what Amber's done. And so I, I am so excited. Uh, you love Jesus with all your heart? Yes. You going to live for him all the days of your life? Yes. What has he done for you? He's got me through so many tough times, and I can't thank him enough for that. Praise God. Praise God. Why don't you get on your knees real quick for me? up Tony I love Tony I love his family they're awesome and I tell you right now his wife she makes really good chocolate um, and, and so and I love it I love it Tony is newer to our family but I, I don't know about you guys but I uh, at Discover Family Church there is no time limit on how many how quickly you can become a part of our family and so if this is week one or week a thousand you can still be a part of our family and and I love watching somebody come in with a love for Jesus, a desire to see Jesus change not just their past, but their future, and watching 
it's been great just to watch you step in and say, you know what, I'm going to be a part of what the family God has for me, and I'm not just going to sit back, and, and I've, I've loved that. You love Jesus with all your heart, Tony? All right, you live for him all the days of your life? All the days of my life. Amen, amen. I love it. Love your family back there watching you today. So today we're going to baptize Tony. So why don't you get on your knees for me? The Norris family, I love this. I, 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 you guys started coming here this past year, and, and I have absolutely adored watching your family grow uh, into being a part of not just our family, but grow as a family to love Jesus more and more, to be able to pray with you guys and see what God's done in your heart, to watch you run a, uh, she ran our kids for our, our youth uh, play for Christmas this year and has a heart for our teenagers and has a heart for people and uh, I absolutely love and adore you guys so much and I'm very very excited to do this today. So Ashley, you got you love Jesus with all your heart. You gonna live for him all the days of your life. What has he done for you? And praise God. Yeah, give God a hand clap. Give God a hand clap. He can do it for everybody. He did it for you. So why don't you get on your knees real quick for me? Praise God. Checked out by the waters. I love it. Jess, it is so great to have you in here. I love you so much. I have uh, watched you be a part of our church, but grow, grow in your relationship with Jesus. She does not miss, even on weeks whenever it's too hot for her in here. She's up front. She's got her fan going. Makes me feel like I'm preaching in Atlanta or something. Uh, and, and I absolutely adore it. She comes and helps us. Uh, with, with Miss Lynn helps clean the building and get it ready for us each and every Sunday just takes pride in loving people and I've watched her bring multiple people to come be a part of our church and, and I love watching your heart you love Jesus with all your heart today? you going to live for him all the days of your life? to infinity and beyond <laughs> I love that what's God done for you? he's opened my eyes <laughs> to everything and he, I know he loves me yeah, he does. Oh, I'm excited. Not my church family. I've been looking for you guys forever, and I found you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I love it. Why don't you get on your knees for me right there? for AJ. I love this kid. I love this kid. I've known you, well, since you were born. Uh, and, and now you are heading off, right? Yeah, you're heading into the Navy? Heading into the Navy. Praise God. Thank you for that. I'm excited to see what God does in your life. Can I tell you right now, you're not just heading into the armed services. You're heading into the mission field that God's calling you to. And you have something special inside you that God created you for. And I can't wait to see what God does with it. 
This kid loves Jesus, and I can't wait for him to show it to the world. And he gets to literally do it to the world from a boat. And so I'm excited for that. You gonna love Jesus for all your life? Yes, sir. Live for him all the days of your life? Yes, sir. He's in your heart? Yes, sir. All right, why don't you get on your knees real quick for me? He was a last minute addition. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, Thank you guys for being here today. We love you guys so much. At Discover Family Church, we are a place where you can be family. If you've never been here before, we'd love to have you back next week. And uh, we can't wait to see what God does next here at DFC. So I love you guys. Have a great rest of your day. We will see you next Sunday at 1030 a.m. for the final service of our Jesus is series before we jump into Easter. Have a great rest of your day. God bless you. Love you.